The pursuit to reach the stars is one of the most complex, dangerous and exciting endeavours of mankind. But with every successful launch, there have been countless mistakes and miscalculations, and some of these were deadly. In today's video, we will look at some of the worst disasters in our attempt to reach the final frontier. We will start with the Soyuz 11 disaster, the crew of which were the only humans to have died in space. In the early 1970s, the Soviet Union were desperate for a major space triumph. Whilst they had much early success in the space race, like sending up the first satellite and the first man into space, the Americans had landed on the moon. The Soviets needed something that could rival such an achievement. Their answer was Salyut 1, the first space station. Following their successful deployment of the space station, the next step was to prove that sending men and material up into space would be viable. Successful flights, such as Soyuz 9, sent men into space for extended periods of time, and Soyuz 10 showed that soft docking with the space station was possible. And whilst the boarding of the station failed and the mission was aborted, further attempts were not deterred. The next mission to the space station was to be Soyuz 11, and it was launched on the 6th of June 1971. Their goal was to prove that long-duration human space flight was possible. The three-man crew consisted of Commander Georgi Dobrovolsky, Flight Engineer Vladislav Volkov, and Research Engineer Viktor Patsyev. They were the backup crew called in only after the prime crew was grounded, as one of them had contracted tuberculosis. They had trained, but not as tightly as the typical Soyuz team. This was to be the flight engineer's second spaceflight, and the first for the commander and the research engineer. Nevertheless, the launch went ahead. The mission started well. They successfully docked with the unmanned space station and set about making necessary repairs. For 22 days, they remained in space, making it the longest any humans had lived off planet. They carried out their experiments, exercised, and even watched live television. On the 29th of June, the crew undocked and began their return home. They loaded their equipment from the station back onto Soyuz 11, but crews of the Soyuz spacecraft before this disaster did not wear pressurized suits. The capsule was just too small for three suited humans, so they just flew in simple flight uniforms. The assumption was that the risk of depressurization was extremely unlikely, something that would be tested this day. Soyuz 11 flew in orbit before its final preparations for re-entry. Before re-entering Earth's atmosphere, both the work compartment and the service module were jettisoned. At this time, the communications went down. The automatic landing sequence began and the module landed without issue in Kazakhstan. All seemed totally normal. On the outside, there were no signs of damage, but also no sounds of life from within. When ground crews opened Soyuz 11, they found all three crew members inside, but every single one of them was dead. According to the report, the state of the crew was as follows. Outwardly, there was no damage whatsoever. On opening the hatch, they found all three men in their couches, motionless, with dark blue patches on their faces and trails of blood from their noses and ears. The crew had suffocated. It was discovered that a small ventilation valve had accidentally opened during the spacecraft's separation for re-entry. Normally, a series of explosive bolts were meant to fire one after another, allowing the modules to separate smoothly, but during Soyuz 11's return, the bolts all fired at the same time. The sudden jolt knocked open a tiny ventilation valve that was only supposed to be opened much later, after the capsule was already in Earth's atmosphere. Instead, it opened around 168 kilometers above Earth. The hole was only small, but it caused a rapid loss of air pressure. As the pressure dropped, and within a matter of seconds, the crew would have passed out from a lack of oxygen. The air inside their lungs expanded and rushed out whilst oxygen concentration in their bloodstream plummeted. The crew suffered what is called ebulism. This is where, as the pressure reaches near zero, the very blood in their bodies began to boil, and their capillaries began to burst. They were dead well before they hit the ground. Rigor mortis had even begun to set in by the time they were removed from the capsule. In light of this disaster, major changes were made to spacecraft design. From that day on, all Soyuz spacecrafts required sealed pressure suits. The faulty valve system was replaced, and re-entry protocols were redesigned. What ought to have been a massive success for the Soviet Union 
turned into an unimaginable horror. Next, we have Apollo 1. On the 27th of January 1967, what ought to have been a routine simulated launch of the Apollo 1 rocket ended in disaster. The three crew members, Commander Virgil Gus Grissom, and pilots Ed White and Roger B. Shafee were killed when the capsule caught fire. The Apollo rocket was NASA's successor to the Mercury and Gemini rockets which had successfully sent Americans into space. NASA's goal, as set by President Kennedy, was to get a man on the moon by 1970. But successes by the Soviet Union's own space program heaped pressure on NASA. The new Apollo rocket had been built to take man to the moon. It was much larger and much more complex than the original Mercury and Gemini rockets and its building and testing was mired by complications, errors and faults. There is a now infamous photograph of the Apollo 1 crew praying over a model of the capsule. The photo was meant as a joke, sent to the program manager Joseph Shea, which came with a caption stating, It isn't that we don't trust you, Joe, but this time we've decided to go over your head. Whilst somewhat tongue-in-cheek, it highlighted the difficulties faced in getting the Apollo rocket ready, and the real concerns of the crew as to its safety. These concerns included the presence of flammable material, such as nylon netting, and inside the capsule, there was loose and exposed wires. On the 27th of January 1967, a routine simulated launch was set. There would be no fuel, no explosive bolts used to separate the boosters from the capsule, and it ought to have been completely safe. At around 1pm, the crew entered the capsule, but there was an immediate problem. The crew complained that there was a sour smell to the oxygen in their suits. After an hour and 20 minutes with no cause found, the test resumed. They were then sealed into the capsule. The three-part complex hatch was bolted shut. Once sealed, the capsule was pressurized and the air replaced with pure oxygen. But then there was another problem, this time with the communication between the pod and mission control. After another delay, at around 6.30pm, the now exhausted crew were finishing up their final checks. There was then a sudden surge of power through the capsule, followed quickly by people shouting, FIRE. It's understood that the fire was started by a damaged wire under Grissom's seat. With a surge in power, the wiring sparked. In the oxygen-rich capsule, and with plenty of flammable materials, the fire quickly took hold and spread. The heat from the fire raised the pressure in the capsule. The crew attempted to open the hatch from within, but it was a long and complex process. In the best of conditions, it could take minutes to open, time that they did not have in a life or death situation. Eventually, the capsule ruptured, fire and gas steaming out. Ground crews attempting to help were pushed back by the heat and the flames. What's more, the masks they had were designed to deal with toxic chemicals and not for smoke, so they proved to be useless. They worked hard on trying to open the hatch, and they eventually did, after five minutes. When they finally got inside, they only found the dead bodies of all three crew members. The removal of the bodies was made even more difficult by the conditions of the capsule, mainly the strands of melted nylon that acted like a glue, cementing the bodies into the interior. The bodies were eventually removed, and the autopsies revealed that the crew had died from smoke inhalation. From this disaster, changes were made, and NASA vowed to not let their deaths be in vain. In July of 1969, Apollo 11 made it to the moon. An Apollo 1 mission patch was brought by the crew of Apollo 11 to the moon's surface. It was left there as a memorial to the crew of Apollo 1. So the crew of Apollo 1 did in some way make it to the moon. Next, we have the Challenger Space Shuttle. On the 28th of January 1986, the Space Shuttle Challenger sat on its launch pad, covered in frost and icicles. Inside were seven crew members, including Krista McAuliffe, who was to be the first teacher in space. Millions of people were watching the live broadcast, including many children eager to see a teacher reach the stars. Thousands of people lined the beaches. The excitement was palpable. What ought to have been a routine flight for the reliable shuttle program turned into a horror show just seconds into the flight. The 28th of January was a particularly cold day. The night before the launch, a cold wave had left the launch pad covered in ice. Frost covered the shuttle, 
and in particular affected the O-rings. The Challenger's solid rocket boosters were built in segments sealed by these flexible rubber O-rings. But there were repeated warnings from the manufacturer that these O-rings would fail in cold temperatures, making them too stiff to properly seal the boosters. Engineers who built these boosters were well aware of the poor weather forecasts and requested that NASA delay the launch, but NASA managers, under scheduled pressure, overruled them. The launch would proceed, despite these very bleak warnings. At 11.38am, the Challenger lifted off. For the first few seconds, everything looked perfect. But onboard cameras captured something horrifying. A small puff of black smoke was escaping from the right booster. This was caused by the failing O-rings, just as had been predicted. A jet of flame was burning through the side of the booster and into the external fuel tank. The shuttle managed to climb into the sky for 73 seconds. All the while, flames burned through the fuel boosters and eventually ignited. The external tank ruptured, tearing Challenger apart in mid-air. The crew cabin separated intact and continued upward before falling back towards the Earth. The terrifying thing is, the crew survived the explosion, or at least some of them did. Three of the emergency air supplies were activated, their cabin crew remained pressurized, and they could have remained conscious at least for a time. The crew even attempted to regain control of what was left of the shuttle, but for over two minutes, the cabin plummeted, reaching speeds of over 200 miles per hour. But the speeds they were reaching, the gradual loss of pressure, and the lack of oxygen likely meant that most of the crew were unconscious by the time the cabin hit the ocean. It is widely thought that the crew died instantly on impact. The Challenger disaster shattered the myth of the safety of the shuttle program. Shuttle flights were halted for nearly three years. A presidential commission into the disaster exposed layers of pressure, negligence, and ignored warnings. It was uncovered that NASA was aware of the risk of O-ring failure, and they didn't examine how such a failure could affect the safety of the mission. The solid boosters were redesigned, but commercial flights for the shuttle were stopped. The damage had already been done. Millions had watched the disaster, including children. For many, it became a formational trauma, but this would not be the last shuttle disaster. On the 16th of January 2003, the Space Shuttle Columbia launched on a scientific research mission. The seven-person crew was led by Commander Rick Husband, Pilot William McCool, Israel's first astronaut, Eileen Raymond, and mission specialists Michael Anderson, David Brown, Laurel Clark, and Kalpana Chawla. The flight, however, began with a disaster. 81 seconds into the launch, a 1.7-pound piece of insulating foam broke off the external fuel tank. Traveling at roughly 600 miles per hour, it hit the leading edge of Columbia's left wing. This part of the wing is protected by reinforced carbon-carbon panels, which provides protection from heat, but they are quite brittle. Unfortunately, this debris strike was not initially noticed by mission or ground control. On the second day of the mission, a routine inspection of the flight footage revealed the debris strike. Engineers were worried about the damage, but NASA's program managers dismissed these concerns. When computer models estimated severe damage to the wing, NASA engineers pushed for the use of high-resolution military satellite imaging to assess the damage. As it was foam that had fallen off, and it was believed that a repair in orbit was not possible, the request for imaging was dismissed. Previous incidents of foam falling off had not caused any issues for the shuttles, but this was not the case for Columbia. Had the imaging been used, it would have revealed a 9 by 17 inch hole in the left wing. On the 1st of February, the Columbia shuttle began its re-entry. Re-entry is the hottest and the most dangerous phase of any mission. During re-entry, the shuttle traveled at around 17,000 miles per hour and as a result was subjected to extremely high temperatures. The shuttle is designed to use the Earth's atmosphere to slow it down during descent compressing the atmosphere. The very shape of the shuttle is designed to make most of this aero braking, but this process causes the air to get incredibly hot, as hot as 3000 degrees Fahrenheit. This process causes superheated plasma to form, which can cause devastating damage to the shuttle. 
but the shuttle is coated in heat-resistant materials to ensure the shuttle doesn't break apart. Tragically, the debris strike had weakened part of the heat-resistant shield on the Columbia, leaving it vulnerable. As the shuttle began its re-entry, the crew had no idea about the damage to the left wing. During re-entry, the hull allowed superheated plasma to enter and begin melting the aluminium structure from within. The internal structure melted, began to soften, and fail. The vital shape of the spacecraft and the wings began to deteriorate, causing the shuttle to twist and spin. Attempts were made to correct this, but the shuffle was no longer aerodynamically sound. Inside, the crew would have been violently thrown around, as many of them were not strapped in. The cabin depressurized extremely quickly, meaning the lack of oxygen likely meant an immediate loss of consciousness. This would have been a small mercy for what would happen next. At an altitude of around 200,000 feet, whilst travelling at the speed of Mach 18, the left wing ripped apart. This caused the shuttle to be completely out of control, tore a hole in the fuselage, and then led to the destruction of the right wing. The crew inside were killed as the shuttle disintegrated and lethal G-forces were acting upon their unconscious bodies. Debris would be found mainly in eastern Texas, but some pieces were found in Louisiana. Some pieces of debris were even found by members of the public and ended up for sale on eBay. Much like after the Challenger disaster, investigations were made, but in 2004, President Bush announced that the shuttle program would be retired. It would be this final disaster that would spell the end of the space shuttle program.